How great is He to you? We sing that song. We sing songs like, Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. And then we go out and live a life where I don't need Christ. I don't need Christ. Hmm. It's more than just music to me, and I know it is to, to most of you. It's, it's ministry through, through music. And I hope that you're, hope that you're allowing this, these songs that we sing from the ones that we sing as a congregation and then uh, the specials that are, that are presented to us. I'm, I'm hoping that you're listening and uh, not just appreciating a job well done, but the message that God has for us. I want to say this before I get into my sermon this morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone that uh, remembered my birthday last weekend. I didn't want to talk about it last Sunday. Uh, my birthday was last Saturday. I didn't want to talk about it on Sunday because of everything that we had going. And I didn't want to, you know, it, well, anyway, so I think you get that. But I do want to say for any, anybody that sent me a card, a gift, in some sort of form of, of, uh, of love, thrown my way on my birthday. I appreciate it very much. And I had a wonderful birthday. And, uh, and many of you uh, that sent me things, so, uh, so made, it made my birthday uh, all the more meaningful. And I felt loved. I felt loved last weekend. I think that was your intention. And, uh, and you accomplished that. So thank you so much for all that you did for me um, last week, last weekend, and even some cards that came in this week. Turn to Matthew chapter 15 in your Bible, and this will be, of course, we always read our, our text at the beginning of our service on Sunday morning and uh, Sunday night, but we will reread it at this time here. And actually, you're going to you, just hold your place there. Matthew 15, hold your place there. The, the great battle for the soul of this country is not really to change you to change the adult. Most of you in here, this, this craziness is happening all around us is not, is not having any effect on you as far as, hmm, as far as like, hmm, I wonder if I'm wrong. I wonder if I've been wrong for my, by the way, I'm 60. I am a full-fledged senior. Full-fledged. Everybody that was cheating me the last five years out of that discount, now they now I get it. So anyway, but whether you're 60, 70, 80, 90, th th look, they're not trying to change you. Satan's not trying to change you. And we sit back and, and think that it's crazy. It's asinine. Uh, it's ridiculous what's going on. Uh, okay. And that's true. And, you, and you're thinking, they're not changing me. They're not trying to. They're not trying to change the older generation, the seniors. And, and even to some point, you know, uh, younger than that, 50s and 40s, they know that you're set. You've got what you believe. It works, particularly when it's the faith in the Word of God. It works. And, okay, but here's what the plan is. Satan's plan for us is to just cause us to tolerate What's that saying? I'll have it written down here, but you'll know it. Uh, all that evil needs to succeed is for good people to stand around and do nothing. Nothing. That's all. Satan's not trying to change us, the believer, the older ones. He says we can't move them, but we can just, if we can just condition them to just sit in their houses and complain about it, but not do anything about it, that's good. That's perfect. That's perfect. The plan of Satan in order to succeed worldwide. And you understand this before I even finish this statement. You know that everything that goes on, God is allowing. You know that, right? There is, God is not up there. Did you see what He just did? 
Oh, what am I going to do? We need to, we, look, hey, we need to get all the angels and, and, and every one of them together. We need to, we need to counsel and have the big counseling session. I'm not quite sure what to do here. God has seen it from the beginning. You, you say, that makes no sense to me. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I'm so glad that I don't have a God that I can figure out. I want a God that can think on a plane that I can't even begin to think on. He's known it from since forever, and it's part of His plan. Does He want people to choose evil? No, but He sees it and He uses it as part of His plan. Make no mistake, the devil never wins. Amen right there. He never wins. I see a meme occasionally, and, and you've heard me say it, and I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to say it until I, keep, until I stop seeing it. <laughs> but I see a meme that says, Satan's winning now, but God wins in the end. Look, let, no, let me correct that. Satan never wins over God. Ever wins. Ever wins. Doesn't happen. Satan can't take a he can't take a step today without God saying, I'm gonna allow you to do thus and such. I already know what you're doing. You're not surprising me. Can you believe what he did? Can you believe what he did today? God says, I know what he was gonna do for thousands upon thousands upon thousands since the very beginning before I created anything. I knew exactly what he was gonna do on September 19 at 1.22 a.m. or 11.22 a.m. Uh, yeah, don't, don't freak out. <laughs> I've only been preaching for like seven minutes, six minutes. He never. God says, no, it's right. I mean, just right according to plan. It's my purpose. I figured, I just, he's, he's a tool. He's a tool. Even at our worst, and even at Satan's worst, he cannot stop the purpose of God. That's very comforting as a believer. Do things frustrate me? Yes. Do I see the news? And Well, I don't see it because I really don't watch the news anymore. I read some selected resources that I trust, mostly. But when I read the next thing that happens, does it frustrate me? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But, look, it doesn't change it doesn't, doesn't make me wonder, maybe I should switch sides. No. <laughs> no, it's not happening. The plan of Satan is to get to the minds of our children. That's his plan. Because they are the next generation of decision makers in this country. And when I say children, I mean everybody. I mean... I mean, you four, I'm sorry, that's Jamie. You three, Christian right up here, <laughs> raise his hand. I mean, teenagers right on down, that's what I mean. His, his, his a, hey, and college folk too. I don't need to, I don't, he doesn't need to get your mind. All he needs for you to sit back and not vote and tolerate. All he needs for you to do is do nothing. Get mad. Hey, watch him. <coughs> watch him scream. I just said I don't never cough in my hands. I just did. I said that in Sunday school, didn't I? I just did. Apparently I still do. Satan never looks. Look, <coughs> he doesn't get that. He, he doesn't. Now I lost my train of thought. He's trying to get to you. And he's trying to get to our kids. He's trying to get to our college age people. I read an article, psych, Psychology Today, I think it was. I didn't read, didn't read the article. I saw the illustration. But in years ago, years ago now, years ago, like 1983, I think, or something like that, they put out in their magazine that like 50% of people that enter college in their freshman year, and look, and this is a long time ago, 50% of those people enter uh, with a, you know, with, with some form of belief in something. 
you know, as far as God goes. I mean, maybe not the Lord Jesus Christ, but some God out there. And when they graduate four years later, the 30% of those 50% have changed their minds during college. They say that we brainwash people in our churches. Okay, A, I don't have any problem with that. Children come into this world with a blank page. They have a sinful nature, but, but, and, and they are going to be whatever they hear and read and the people they hang around, that's what they're going to become. And I say we get all over that blank page and write all the scripture on that blank page that we can write on it and fill their minds with the Word of God. <clears throat> that's what they're going to do in school. That's what they're going to do in our schools, in college. They're going to try to indoctrinate them and talk them out of their faith. Anybody see? I saw this. I didn't hear it. I saw it. I saw the clip where a gentleman was talking to a school board somewhere in this nation, and he said, he said, you have approved for sec explicit sexually, sexual pictures to be shown to, I don't know, like second graders or something. He said, I have talked to a judge. The judge is in complete, in complete agreement with this. And if you, every one of you don't, 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 uh, don't resign, you will be charged. Look, I'm not saying that everybody that teaches in a public school are bad people. We, we have people in this church that teach in public schools. And, and thank God that somebody's in there. The wheat among the tares. Instead of the tares among the wheat. The wheat among the tares trying to thank God for them. But as a whole, I am telling you, they're after our kids and school is a big part of it. If Satan can train the next generation to, to, to propagate his ungodly plan, that's what he's trying to do. Public schools, public colleges are hotbeds for secularism. You say, well, what exactly is secularism? It is, find, it is the search for happiness, meaning, fulfillment, and harmony in your life outside of God. It is to say, we won't go that path. We're going to find it right here. And you cannot. You can't. I'd like to think that that our that I'd like to think that our parents in this day and time uh, um, would bring their children every time the church doors are open would get their children here. Church cannot rear your children. Okay, and so a lot of people want that. They think that we we'll just get them to church all that we can. That's the best decision you can make. But church cannot rear your children. We can do the best we can to supplement and to reinforce what you, our parents, should be doing at home. That's what we do. And to try to give you guidelines and Scripture and truth to use as you bring them up, as you train them up in the ways of the Lord. We cannot rear your children for you. But it's a good thing to get them here as often as you can because they are spending so much time in, in, in schools where they, are, where they are, are now seemingly, and there are some schools that are better than others, no doubt, but seemingly trying to fight against everything that you believe in and teach in a different way. Now I want you to look at this lady here in Matthew chapter 15. This lady, uh, this mother here, I'm going to use her as an example this morning, as a mother that just said, look, I'm going to get some answers. I'm going to get Jesus' help. Verse 21, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Now, a Canaanite woman would be a Jew or a Gentile. Gentile. There were Jews and Gentiles. You're either a Jew or you're everybody else, which is called Gentile people. 
and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She believed. She believed in Christ. She had faith in Jesus Christ. Called him Lord, the son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Possessed. Possessed daughter. And there are people that are possessed today. It is still going on in this country. And doctors don't know what to do with them because they don't know the scripture. They get them in, they just medicate them. They try to medicate the devil out of them. <laughs> now, not everybody that takes medication is possessed. You understand that. But there are far more people walking. Look, what do you think these people do that, are, that, that you read about that got in a gunfight with the police? And by the way, if you don't ever want to be shot by police, just obey the police. Do what they tell you to do. When they say, get out of your car, get out of your car. When they tell you to do this or that, do this or that. Man, I've I got so many... I got to I got to get off these trails, these rabbit trails. Cuz as I said, I have I have lost my way again. Goodness. See what turning 60 does to you? It's horrible. It's a horrible thing. My knee hurts worse. The benefits, no, the the the, the hey Say amen, seniors, but the, uh, the, the bad things about turning old far outweigh the benefits. Okay, let me just get back to the scripture. How about that? Grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. He kind of ignored her. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. In other words, she's getting on her nerves making all this racket. Would you send her away? Jesus said, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm sent to the Jews, he said. It's kind of the first rebuke was that he didn't answer her. The second one says, I've come to the Jews, not the Gentiles. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread, the Jews, the, the, the Jews' bread, the spiritual bread, and cast it to the dogs. The dogs meaning Gentile people. He's testing her. And she said, truth. <laughs> truth. Or what they used to say in young people's lives, word. <laughs> right? Word. Word up. They probably don't say that anymore. She said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. I love that. And he said, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from the very hour. He was testing her to see if she would keep coming and keep coming and keep coming back. And she kept coming and kept coming and kept coming back. And she could have gotten offended. She could have got offended. What are you calling me a dog? I'm just saying, look, I'm worth every bit as much as these Jewish people. She didn't. She still called him Lord and she worshipped him. And she kept coming, and she kept coming. And he was making, he was actually creating an example for us, is what he was doing. She did not ask that the children of Israel, the Jews, might be deprived of any fragment of their portion. But taking her place among the dogs, she could still claim him. Him as her master and asked for the crumbs of his mercy. She owned being a Gentile. She showed humility. She showed humility that day. I know I'm a Gentile. I know I'm not God's cho of God's chosen nation. And she was humble with that. She showed modesty that day. In that she said, all I'm looking for are some of the crumbs of your mercy. I'm just looking for the scraps that fall off the table. I'm not trying to be one of them. I just want the crumbs. 
Then she showed uh, fervency and passion in her prayer. She just kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back. Then I got to thinking about the, the life of the mother's daughter as I read this. What would happen to her life? As she was healed of the possession, what happened to her? And I think this often with people that we see healed in the Bible, I wonder what happened later. Like I wonder if this girl, I guarantee you this, if that mother had such a faith and went into the presence of Jesus and just said, I'm not, basically, I'm not leaving until I get what I want. I would, I would think, now I don't know this, but I would think that she, when she got back home and the book of Mark tells us that the, her daughter was sitting in her right mind and at peace as she saw that, I've got to believe that she said, I'm going to rear this girl up, my daughter up in, 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 in the ways of God. In the ways of God. So, with that in mind, with, with, with that thought in mind here, I want to transition a little bit in the service. Now, the rest of this sermon is going to a little, be a little bit class classroom. Sorry, Rachel. Sorry, teens. <laughs> Y'all are back in the classroom this morning. Um, but I want us to concentrate on... I want us to concentrate on the mindset that she had in order to get her daughter delivered from Satan and possession. And then I would think most likely rearing that daughter to worship God as she did. We're going to talk about some things about child rearing this morning. And I've got ten things I'm going to work through really quick. And the three points to follow them and then that's it. So it's like 13 points. I probably won't spend more than 15 minutes on each point. Now, if you listen, and if you'll say amen once in a while without me having to ask for it, we'll get done quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you people. <laughs> You're unbelievable. Yesterday, our brother Dickie came over and helped me fill in a bunch of holes in my yard. Here where trees had, had died and the, and, the, and the stumps had been cut down and then the roots die and the things sink down. I had a ton of them in my yard and he helped me with it yesterday. And we filled the holes in. Why? Why? You didn't really see them all. You couldn't really see them all. But why would you fill the holes in? You know why? Because <laughs> I saw one of my, the twins running across the yard one day. <laughs> yeah. And then face first she hit the dirt. Her leg went into a hole. Cause her to stumble and fall. We've got to do that for our children. We've got to fill in the holes on their pathway. We've got to give them a level playing ground. We've got to pave that way for them. Not in easiness, but in truth. That they may not stumble into the pitfalls and the snares that Satan has, la has laid for them. Quickly now. Not in necessarily any order here, okay? Just as they came to my mind. But number one... As a parent, and listen, and as a grandparent, you know, you're not, look, we're not their parents anymore. Okay, now I understand that. Okay, but, but, but we, we should encourage and influence as much as we are allowed to by the parent. Bring them to the Lord. When that child comes into this world, you know, the, 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 you should be watching and teaching and getting them in Sunday school and teaching them at home, waiting for that day, that opportunity to introduce them to Jesus and to salvation. Instead, parents will say, well, they're five and they're talking about getting saved, but that's just too young. What in the world? What are we doing? All of my kids got saved at... Five, I think. And look, and the two girls got, got, got their reassurance, you know, later. Two or three, four years later. Now, I'm not talking about having somebody pray that doesn't understand. But if they understand, you need to give them that opportunity to invite Jesus into their heart. 
What greater responsibility do you have than to lead them to Christ as a parent? Number two, pray for them. Pray for them. Is that not what the lady was, is the great illustration? Jesus isn't here walking around in that town in Midlothian. Tomorrow he'll be in Richmond. Next he'll be in Fredericksburg. And he'll be down here uh, back in Chesterfield next week. No. But he is, we have access to him 24-7. And we need to bring our children to him and say, My children, my child has a problem. And I need your help desperately, Lord, Son of David. Next, we need to teach them to seek Jesus through Bible reading and prayer. Relationship before rules, right? Is that not what we believe? It's what I believe. Too many people look at conservative Baptist churches and say, ah, they just believe a bunch of rules. And, and, and we're guilty of that sometimes. Not of having rules, but that being the only basis for which, we, for, for which we associate with God at all are just the rules that we keep. No. Relationship before rules. We need to know God. We need to know Jesus. We need to know Him personally. And allow Him then to reveal the truth to us as a believer and as a person and, and, and who has a close relationship with the Savior that says, I want to do everything you want me to do. Relationship before rules. Next, teach them to trust their Heavenly Father. Tithing, sacrifice of time and energy. Uh, look, if, if, don't look, try not to fret and, and, and freak out, as I like to say, in front of your children. Teach them there is a God that, that has you right there. That you are in Christ and God is and Christ is in God. And there is no falling. Amen. <laughs> I just tacked on five more minutes. Teach them to trust God. Next, five. Teach them to honor God with their lives. Next, teach them self-discipline. Proverbs 20, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. A city that depends on its walls for protection from the enemy. When those walls are broken down, the enemy may rush in and conquer the city. Correct? God says when a person cannot, has no self-discipline, they have no walls. And any and everything... Is, is, comes in and storms into their life and wrecks and ruins. Next, teach them to serve others. Siblings, serve their siblings. Serve, get along with their siblings. Their teachers, Sunday school teachers, youth pastor, principals, people in authority. They should serve them. And encourage them as their authorities. When I got saved, it, look, it, I struggled a lot, but it wasn't because I had a problem with God's authority in my life. I had already been under authority, which was my father and my mother. And, and they demanded obedience. So when I got saved and somebody said, you have a heavenly father and he, and, he, and he wants you to obey. I'm like, what? That's normal, right? Well, of course, that's easy to believe. Why? Because I had already been trained up that way. Next, teach them obedience. Faith is revealed through obedience. Next, number nine, teach them respect for authority. Teach them respect for authority. And number 10, buckle up on this one. Model the way. You be what you're teaching them. Or else your words will be empty. They have got to see that you believe, you believe what you're teaching them as much as you, as much as you want them to believe what you're teaching them. Model the way. Your walk talks... And your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. 
Now, why don't we do a better job at training? Our, and these are just ten things. You know, the list can, is bigger than that. But these are just ten things that I wrote down off the top of my head. Why don't we do a better job of training our children? Three quick points here. We are far more concerned with ourselves than we are with our children. D.L. Moody said, before we pray for God to fill us, I believe we ought to pray for Him to empty us. Empty us of, of ourselves. It's me. What makes me happy? What makes me satisfied? What, what makes me, me, me? We're so caught up in that. And our kids are running around getting, getting into everything. You know, it amazes me when you hear, so-and-so child got shot. You know, 16-year-old child got shot, you know, at this location yesterday. I always go and look for what time it is. And almost every single time it's after midnight. And our children have no business being out after midnight. <laughs> Bad thing, look, the booger man does come out after midnight. And there's a lot of them. Okay? He's out there. And he will shoot your children. We're more, what, why? Hey, but we don't care. Where, where, where's your child? I don't know. They're out somewhere. I'm sure they're doing okay. Probably not. They're probably not. Do we spend more time planning our days and less time planning our children's time? Technology was supposed to give us more time to do the important things in life. But the truth is it has stolen our minds away from what is important and addicted our minds to what is fun and amusing. Oh, preacher, getting on, getting on social media again. That's exactly right. Now I'll probably be getting on it more often. Folks, we use it. Yes, we use it. You know why we use it? Because you're on it. <laughs> you and everybody's on it. If everybody just said, I'm off of social media, we'd stop. We'd, we'd save ourselves hours and hours of time every week, and we'd stop. No, but we're going to use it for the glory of God. Because people are on there for the glory of Satan, addicted to these things. Number two, why we don't do a better job training our children. Uh, we, have mixed, we have mixed up raising with rearing. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train means to instruct with dedication. That's what that word train in the Bible uh, uh, means in, in the Hebrew. Instruct with dedication. Not simply providing them with the physical things they need to survive. This is not a game of survival. It's a game that God's people are supposed to win. It's not a game. But you understand what I'm saying. We are supposed to be victorious. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We are supposed to be victorious. But yet we're not. We just don't. We, ju we give our kids what they, my God, hey, I protect my child and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and I give them food and I give them shelter and I give them clothes. It was like the person said one time, you ra I raise my kids right. Well, you raise hogs and you rear children. You raise hogs and you train up children purposefully. Number three, look, we're lazy. We're just lazy sometimes. We give them everything they desire so they'll stay, so they'll stop asking us for our time. And not saying that I have never been guilty of this. I'm not saying that at all. We hope that they'll get interested and distracted and stop asking for my time. Now, what to do? <clears throat> Pray for them and expose them as much as possible to the things of God. Plan it out. Find out what the church is doing and get involved with it and get your children, keep your children uh, around church, which is the greatest tool that God gave to you to rear those children. But we're just a tool. 
Next, become an expert in training up your children. Read what God's Word has to say about it. Read books written by good people. Dr. Spock, and I'm not talking about Star Trek. How many people know who I'm talking about? Back in the 60s, wrote a book about child rearing. Bunch of people, bunch of people followed, just woofed it down and followed his. You know what he said? Stop. <laughs> okay, I've never read the book. This is what I've been told. Basically said, you don't need to discipline your children anymore the way you're disciplining. Stop spanking your kids. You know what the Bible says? You know what the Bible believes? You know what God believes in? Corporal punishment. We may want to edit this part out. Uh, pretty much, a, look, why'd you get saved? I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. I got saved because I didn't want the pain and torment of eternal damnation in hell. That's why I got saved. Now you can, you should praise, we should praise, we should reward the good, but listen to me. When we stop, when we stop spanking our children as a form of discipline, look, God put a lot of padding in that area for a purpose. When we stop spanking children, this is what we got. One of the reasons, one of the reasons. How many spankings did Davy get, Mom? What'd you say? Not as many as me. <laughs> it's true. I wasn't bad, but I was incredibly ingenious in mischief. I was brilliant in that one area of my life. No. And I got spanked a lot. And you know what? And I thank God for it. I thank God for it. Now you can't even put your hands on a child, hardly. Schools aren't even allowed to touch a child. They, they get in, when they want to take a kid out of the room, they, several of them will get in a group like this and they'll, they'll move like this to usher the kid out of the room. They'll encircle the kid and they'll all move like an amoeba. <laughs> they can't touch. Now look, and look, and I know, I know there are people in this world that abuse every right that you have. And I know that there are people in this world that, that take godly discipline and, and turn it into something monstrous and bad. But it doesn't mean that we should walk away from God's Word. When I spank my kids, most of them, most of the time, I would send them to my room, and I'd wait a couple minutes, and then I would go back to my room, and I'd explain the entire situation. I'd tell them, who did wrong? Is daddy, mad? Is daddy mean? Or why are you getting spanked? Because I did wrong. Is daddy mean? No. Does daddy love you? Yes. Would you do wrong? I'd have them explain it to me to make sure we were very clear why they were about to receive pain. And I want to teach them that doing wrong is equals pain in this life, because it does. Anyway, train up your children in the way they should go. Model the way. That's what we should do. Give them a godly example to follow. A.W. Tozer, I'm going to skip that there. Look, the, these ideas that we've talked about this morning are more easily implemented if we would understand that our children belong to God first. And it is our responsibility to train them up in His ways. His ways. Not yours, not yours and mine, what we can tolerate, but in the ways of God. This mother here went to Jesus and said, my daughter needs help. Act like you didn't even hear her. Whoa, hey, hey, you hear me. I know you. I don't know what she said. I'm just making it up. I'm not, hey, I'm not going away. <laughs> I'm not going away. You're going to talk to me. 
I don't know what she said, but she stayed there and she kept crying out. So much that the disciples said, Can't send her away. Then Jesus finally says, Okay, fine. What do you want? Lord, Lord. Son of David, my daughter, my daughter, possessed. <laughs> and he basically not, he said, not anymore. And he basically said, as you wish. Because when you read, when you finish that out there, he said, be it as thou wilt. In other words, whatever you, whatever you want done in her life, it's done. The problem is we look at our children and we, we don't want bad enough like she did. We don't want the right thing done, done in their life. We don't want it bad enough like she did. But we can get our prayers answered. As, as, as you wish, you can hear those same words. Train up that child. Do the best you can through his spirit. And God will help you. And instead of them being, becoming tools of Satan, they can become a tool of God for right in the battle of good and evil, light and darkness, God and Satan, they can become what God wants them to become and be eternally grateful and happy.